Hi, this is Dr. Tom Ulrich, and this is my eighth video on my set of videos that are intended to be uh, helping you with um, kind of meant to be companions to my notes on systematic Bible study technique. If you happen to stumble on this video and you're like, what are these? Uh, it's, a, it's a handout I created to help you uh, learn how to study the Bible for yourself. You can get a copy of the handout for free of charge at tomulrichconsulting.com slash church. And uh, this video in particular is about Appendix A, which is all about using commentaries. All right, so uh, starting here on uh, page 18, uh, we have Appendix A, and we have some rules of thumb. So first of all, uh, you know, when you're doing your private study, don't just run to the commentaries. A major goal of this technique is, is to help you learn to think biblically for yourself. Um, you know, if you just immediately run to the commentary, it, it robs you of your chance to learn to think for yourself. So commentaries are things we use at the end, not the beginning. And another comment I would make is, you know, make is, you know, the 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 way this method works is you do your homework, you get together with the gang, you discourage, share your findings. Um, and nothing can kill a discussion uh, more effectively and thoroughly than just starting quoting commentaries. You know, it gets to outline, well, so-and-so, you know, this guy present into this seminary said, you know, this is your company, you know, this is the outline. Don't, don't do that. You know, the idea is we're, we're all working together. We're all learning to do these things together and just um, running to an authority that, you know, it's hard to, for the average person to, to, to challenge is it just ruins the conversation. So, so don't do that. Okay, then. So when do we use commentaries? Well, a couple things. One is we do use them for historical information. So usually what happens at the beginning of a commentary, so if you have a commentary on James, you know, the first chapter will be kind of history, background. Well, that's all. Remember, that's in our first step for the, the overall approach is we do the history study. So you use a commentary for that. Um, you know, for confusing verses, they can be really helpful. Um, but my warning is, you know, don't give in too quickly. A lot of these things, you'll be surprised how you can sort them out. If you really do work through, you know, find, make all the observations, get the core Ross references, you'll be amazed at how many of these things you can actually solve on your own. And as a minimum, at least if you do the work, then you'll understand the questions that the commentaries are answering. And um, uh, the other thing to do is, you know, before you give in too quickly, consult other translations. I mean, sometimes there'll be another translation that just says a little bit differently, like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. But at any rate, but ultimately, you know, what what they'll do is they will, uh, you know, I keep mentioning this First uh, Peter 3, you know, this crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, the commentaries will tell you all the different competing views, and they'll usually say the one they, they think is right. Another reason to use commentaries is for quality control. So here's the deal. Um, you know, we're trying to teach you to, to, learn, think, to learn to think biblically for yourself, and um, that's good. And if you're just sharing your work, you know, to the, to the small group, that's, that's really great. If, however, you've been asked to stand in front of a crowd and they're viewing you as an expert and you're going to say these things, you know, you really want to check some commentaries to make sure you didn't overlook a few critical details. I mean, here's the thing. You should be learning all sorts of things that are new to you, but after 2,000 years of Bible scholars, uh, most of the reasonable interpretations have been written up somewhere, and so if you've got an idea that really isn't anywhere, okay, that is a major red flag. Now, to be clear, um, you know, we do want new kinds of, uh, of applications, you know, so maybe you can, you know, have some ideas and on, um, uh, you know, how these verses might apply to uh, driving on Southern California freeways. You know, that, that, that's good. But, uh, you know, if you're using this method and now proposing major new doctrines, that, that's bad. Um, okay, another reason is for additional ideas and tidbits. So if you're teaching a Bible study, you might want to check in, you know, after you've done your homework and, you know, worked on all the method, um, you know, you can just find some tidbits and interesting things, add some color to your to your teaching. And uh, also for broad perspective, I mentioned that a little bit in quality control, is, you know, they, they will um, give you the alternative, uh, alternate interpretations, especially if you're reading, leading like a small group where it's people or a group where people are allowed to ask questions. I mean, um, 
you know, you do your work and you, you, you've got this clear thing and then someone asks a question about something, you're like, what? If you check commentaries, they'll kind of warn you of all the different views so you can, you know, not be kind of stuck like a deer with his, uh, uh, you know, looking in the headlights. All right, so moving on to page 19. Uh, something to know about commentaries, there's different kinds of commentaries. They're not all the same. So, um, you know, when people write commentaries, they are trying to accomplish something, and what their goal is really affects how they turn out. And in, in broad technical, uh, broad sweeping terms, there's three kinds of commentaries. There's technical commentaries, devotional commentaries, and background commentaries. So what a technical commentary is, is that's intended to help people like you and me who are trying to study this for ourselves and it'll answer a lot of, of nitty-gritty questions and, and really nuts and bolts. Although you will be surprised uh, at how many times you'll have some big question, you'll check three or four commentaries, you're like, wow, none of them answer the question I'm really wondering about. And, and I'll, I'll tell you what the issue is. Um, sometimes people who write commentaries really swim in the text a lot, and you can tell it, and uh, they uh, really will get to your questions. Other times, you know, it's like, well, they're scholars. They got a contract to write something, and they, you know, read some papers and read some of the commentaries and synthesized it and without ever really swimming. And, and I, I will make the shocking, which may be shocking, statement that the truth is if you do this method, you'll, in many cases, uh, have spent more time with the text than a lot of the people, the professionals who are writing commentaries. Not all of them, though. Some of them, you know, will be spend their whole life on, on one book and they'll have just amazing stuff, you know. And uh, guys like F.F. F. Bruce, I mean, they just swim in the text for years and their insight is just infinite. And other ones are just like, what? Anyway, so uh, the next kind of commentary is devotional commentary. And they're the kind of thing you might want to read in your quiet time. Uh, they have interesting things to say and they, you know, they'll start telling a story about something their grandmother said one time. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Ironside is a preacher from the 1900s. He had a complete set of commentaries in the whole Bible, and they're, they're devotional. They have some really great insights and really very encouraging. But, you know, I remember one time, I think I think it was the one, his one on Galatians I was using when I was studying Galatians, and I finally was like, okay, the only thing in this book he didn't discuss is Galatians. He just kept sort of vectoring off. And, you know, wonderful. It was encouraging. But devotional commentaries aren't necessarily helpful for what we're doing. So you might want to buy them just to be encouraged. But if you're wanting to spend your money, you know, to, to help with the study, you're, you're looking, you're not looking for devotional commentaries. Then there's background commentaries. Now, these, this is a fairly new phenomenon that showed up in the last 20 years or so. And what they do is they'll go verse by verse and they'll just tell you background information. So they won't tell you, okay, this is what it means and this is how to resolve it and anything. They won't provide an outline. But what they will do is like if it mentions the Temple of Artemis or something, it'll just tell you about the Temple of Artemis. And it mentions, you know, if it mentions some guy, Ananias, it'll tell you all about Ananias. So it, it's, it's like sort of a history study on every verse. All right, so what commentaries should you buy? Well, uh, first of all, running out and buying a huge set of commentaries uh, is pretty risky because, um, you know, sometimes what will happen is some, some guy will, you know, maybe he spent his life studying the Gospel of Luke. He writes this amazing commentary on Luke. And then the, uh, the publishers come back and say, that was great. We want to give you a contract for you to write a, a, a commentary on every book in the New Testament. So, well, he's got a lifetime of study behind Luke and he's just... You know, basically, when he writes the one on Second Peter, he's just completely uninspired, and so the the quality uh, of commentary sets can vary amazingly, particularly if the set is by a single author. I mean, in almost no case do I ever recommend saying go get Bob's commentary on the whole Bible. It just never seems to work out. Uh, a very good tip, though is um, ask other people who do serious Bible study. You know, if you know any, go talk to your pastor. Hey, I'm about to study Galatians. What's your favorite commentary in Galatians? You know, seminary profs, if you know anyone's. You know, just ask people. Uh, if Fee and Stewart, if you look at their book, uh, they actually give you a list like, these are the commentaries we recommend you use for each book. Um, Tremper Longman III, he is a, an amazing Old Testament scholar. He's got a lot of um, 
just fantastic stuff. I think I, one of my videos I showed the Baker Bible Dictionary, the new Baker Bible Dictionary, or whatever it's called. Longman was the editor of that. He's got some great stuff. Um, he wrote this book called The Old Testament Commentary Survey, and then D.A. Carson, who's one of the really amazing evangelical New Testament scholars, he, he did the similar book for New Testament. What these two books are, is they answer the question, which commentaries are good for which book? And they will say, they will talk about whole sets. So like they'll say, you know, the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Uh, the original version was by Frank Gabaline. The new versions by uh, the editors, the general editors, Tremper Longman. But they, you know, they, they will tell you, and they give like stars, you know, this one's a two star to three star, and they'll talk you through. So these books are fantastic. I put the ISBNs here on page 19, so you can just kind of, paste those numbers into Amazon or to cbd.com and then you know they'll get it. So that that's a good tip. All right, zooming on to page 20. Uh, there are a few that I really like and I recommend. Um, there's one called the Bible Knowledge Commentary by Walver Zuck. It's 1986. So that's getting to be a little bit old. I mean when I started this, you know, my first version of the handout was 1984. This was new and like, well, yeah, it's getting a little long in the tooth. It's still pretty good. It's two volume set. Uh, it's 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 pretty good. It, it it's has even though it's you know addresses all the books of the Bible in two volumes. It's amazing how it really tends to address the questions I have. Another great one is called the Life Application Bible Commentary, not to be confused with the Life Application Bible. So the people who wrote the Life Application Bible, they wrote that it was very well received, and they said, hey, we should do a commentary, uh, to, kind of with the same theme, and so. Whereas the you know the, the life application Bible is one big old honking Bible, the life application Bible commentary, and you can kind of see it here on sheet 20. I've got a picture. You know, it's like 20 volumes or 17 volumes. It's actually pretty good. It's got some good insight. It's got some good application. It's good, and I've got the number there. Uh, Tyndale New Testament commentaries for the New Testament. Boy, you can never go wrong with them. That's another good set, 20 sets. Um, and, and for both those life application and Tyndale New Testament, it's it's by multiple authors. So what they did, you know, the Tyndale one, they, you know, they when they went to do the one on First Thessalonians, they said, well, who's who really knows First Thessalonians? And they asked that guy to, or that guy or that gal to write it, rather than just have somebody, you know, write something uninspired. Uh, Expositor's Bible Commentary, that's one of my favorites. Frank Gabaline was the editor. Um, that one's getting a little bit old, but they, you had, uh, Tremper Longman, like I just mentioned, just released a revised edition and it's fantastic. Uh, University Press has the Bible background commentary. So that's one of these background commentaries I talked about that just kind of goes through and gives a little something on every verse. Uh, the New Testament biblical or New International Biblical Commentary. I really like that one. It's a 36 volume set, not too expensive, and it's it's pretty good. And again, it's it gets experts talking about each book rather than one guy talking about everything. Um, there's another one here called the Word Biblical Commentary, and you know when I, I remember especially when I talked I took uh, Hebrew in seminary. Um, you know, the professor was just all giddy about this thing. And, and there's some really great stuff, and really good scholarship. But it um, it's a tough commentary to read. There's a lot of stuff if you don't have language training. I mean, if you haven't studied Greek and Hebrew, you know, it gets to be pretty onerous. And uh, the other thing is, is it's um, these other ones I've mentioned, you know, they're going to give you evangelical views. Where biblical commentary is not necessarily going to give you an evangelical view. You know, it'll give you all the views, and it's it's a good good set. Um, but uh, and it's expensive too. I mean, it's I don't know how many volumes there are. It's probably eighty. I mean, there's you know like Psalms. There's there's two volumes for Psalms, and you know there's a lot of so it's actually more volumes than there are books in the Bible. At uh, any rate, that those are my thoughts on. Uh, Bible commentaries. Hopefully that was helpful and uh, we'll talk to you later.